All right, Mark, is it okay if I go ahead and get us started officially? Let's do it. All right, well, cool. Good afternoon, everyone, if you are on the East Coast, and good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for today's Bloomerang webinar, Goal Setting to Help Your Nonprofit Thrive. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Just want to let you all know that we are recording this presentation. And I'll be sending out that recording as well as the slides later on today if you didn't already get them. So if you have to leave early or perhaps you want to review the content later on, uh, have no fear. We'll be sending out all those goodies uh, later on this afternoon. And as you're listening today, please feel free to chat in any questions that you have. We're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so don't uh, be shy about that at all. Send in your questions and comments, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible before the 2 o'clock Eastern hour. Uh, you can also send us questions and comments on Twitter. I'll be keeping an eye on the Twitter feed there. You can use our hashtag, uh, Bloomerang, and our username is at Bloomerang Tech. And one last item, if you have any trouble with the audio through your computers, we find that the uh, phone audio is usually a little bit better. So if you can dial in and you don't mind dialing in, uh, try that before you give up on us uh, completely. Usually the audio quality is uh, by the computer is really dependent on Wi-Fi and all those good things, but phone is just, uh, is just the phone. So try that if you have any trouble, uh, and hopefully you'll get a better uh, audio stream that way. And if this is your first uh, Bloomerang webinar with us, just want to say an extra special hello to you. We do these webinars just about every Thursday. Uh, we bring on a great guest like Mark for a uh, super educational presentation. Uh, but in addition to that, we offer donor management software. That's kind of our core business, what we're most known for. Uh, and if you are interested in learning more about that or checking us out or maybe want to switch sometime in the future, uh, visit our website. You can even download a quick video demo and see the software in action. Don't even have to talk to a salesperson if you don't want to. Who wants to do that after all? Um, so check us out if you are interested. But for now, I am super excited to introduce one of my favorites. Uh, he's my brother from a different mother. He's Mark A. Pittman. How's it going, Mark? Hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm going to brag on you if you don't mind before I hand it over to you. If you guys oh, I wanted don't to give Mark... you space too because it sounded like oh, you, were, I know. Yeah, you were open to that. So I do. Totally I'm really fun. open to it. Um, <laughs> you can see uh, Mark is really a uh, very accomplished uh, young man here. He is the author of a great book. It's sitting here on my bookshelf, uh, Ask Without Fear. Uh, he is also the founder of the Concord Leadership Group and FundraisingCoach.com, a great website, great blog. Um, definitely check that out af afterwards. He's also the Executive Director of the Nonprofit Academy, which I think he's going to talk about at the end. It's something you should definitely consider joining. Uh, and he's also an advisory panel member of Rogare, which is uh, a really brand new and probably the most prestigious uh, fundraising think tank. And Mark, did you go to France and England for that that meeting recently? Did you guys I all get together? I did not. No. Oh, but I know it's. I tough. know. I, Tom was Tom Ahern was tweeting me and t and emailing me um, throughout just so I knew <laughs> how much I was missing. <laughs> I know. I'm, I didn't get to go either, but I'm not on the I'm on the on the panel uh, either. But. Um, Mark has been helping nonprofits for many years. He's been featured in tons of media outlets. He's a frequent conference speaker, frequent webinar guest, um, way too many uh, things to list here. And you're really going to see a lot of that expertise come alive uh, over the next hour or so. Uh, he hails, uh, used to be in Maine, but now in South Carolina, right, Mark? Not North Carolina. Woohoo, yeah. Hashtag, yeah, that yeah. Greenville. Yeah, Greenville. He's got a beautiful family. I, I, I tease Mark that him and his wife need to like freeze their DNA because he has these um, amazing children that are like <laughs> geniuses and musicians and videographers. Um, and uh, I'm, I think I'm done. So I'm going to pass things off to you, Mark, to tell oh, us all Oh, man, about. I'm just getting warmed up. This is great. My head uh. won't leave the room now. It's just still <laughs> swollen up like the aunt on Harry Potter. I'm just like <laughs> floating in the ceiling right now. <laughs> Thanks well, so good. much. Well, I'm super excited to be here. You know, as 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 you know, Stephen, you're one of my favorite people in the universe. You could have a little bromance going on here, but I think people are here to to talk about content instead. So, um, ground rules for our time with all of you that are attending: please feel free to drop in questions in the chat. Stephen's going to be checking them. Um, he graciously said we'd leave time to the end. 
Uh, I'm the kind of presenter that I want to help people in the moment too. So um, feel free, you know, I'm, I've given him permission to interrupt me with his own thoughts um, or if questions come in uh, from the chat to interrupt me at any point because the only reason we're here is to help you. Um, we, we could, yeah, there, there's a lot of things you could do with your hour. And um, we want to make sure that we, we give you sk skills and tools and a different mindset uh, when it comes to turning a nonprofit. Because running a nonprofit is pretty hard. Um, I, I, I tell people, and you can't see my hands moving. Uh, my stepdad was Italian, but somehow some of the DNA got to me. My, my hands move all over. Um, but running a nonprofit is, you know, if you run a business, you're the, you're, let's say you start a business, you're the boss. And maybe you have some staff, and then you take excellent care of your customers because they're your revenue stream to be able to keep yourself in business. Um, but a nonprofit isn't like that. If you're the boss of the nonprofit, the founder or the CEO, the executive director, whatever, your your first thought is you have the staff, and then you have your clients. But your clients tend to be not the ones that are funding your operations, and your boss tends to be this group called a board. Even if you're the head person in your organization, you have this board of directors. When they're the board, they're your boss, not the individuals, although sometimes the individuals forget that and think they're your boss. Um, but then you have this fourth group, which is a funding, their funding stream, which are these donors. Um, and it can often feel like you're torn between the board's lists of what to do and the donors' requirements for what funding is, and then the clients and the staff thinking that they know better when they often do. Um, it just is a hard, hard job. Uh, it often can feel like this picture here, or you're building the bridge as you're walking across it. Um, and part of the problem with building the bridge when you're walking across it, if you're doing that all in what Stephen Covey would call quadrant one activity, uh, important and urgent, putting out fires, uh, is that you may find out that the bridge is going to going to the wrong shore. That uh, you're not, you don't end up. There's a great story, a book from the 70s. Uh, it's called "If You Don't Know Where You're Going, You'll Probably End Up Somewhere Else." Uh, it was given as a, it was written for, for seniors graduating from high school, but it was actually good for anyone in life. It's, it's really important to know, begin with the end in mind, know where you're going. You'll hear a lot throughout the, our, our time together, uh, Franklin Covey speak, and that's because I am, in addition to having a master's in organizational leadership, my, uh, I have executive coach training certification from Franklin Covey. Uh, and the seven habits of highly effective people is something that I find is very enjoyable reading where a lot of people find it academic and dense. So um, you'll hear me drop a lot of those Q2, Q1s, but I'll try to definitely explain them. As a nerd, I wanted to do some, some leadership training or leadership research. So a couple of years ago through uh, Bloomerang and uh, generosity of a lot of other people getting it on their list, we had over a thousand people take a leadership survey and, and we're, um, Compass Point and Board Source and all these others work with boards and executive directors and leadership. I really wanted to look at leadership all the way through the organization because if they're they're I think it's I think the stat is 10,000 boomers reaching retirement age every year for the next 18 years that Pew Pew Research put out. Um, and so we know that retirement doesn't equal retiring. Retirement age doesn't equal retiring. But there are there's a, an enormous cohort of people that are moving closer and closer to no longer being on the planet. <laughs> All of us are moving towards, you know, the, the great gift of life is that we die. Uh, one of the great gifts, one of the, one of the certainties is that we will no longer be here at some point. And so there's going to be this tremendous shift in leadership, and we need to be training people in all areas of our organization to be able to take on that leadership should that happen and that should that need to rise. So we've been able to do that. Um, I'll remind you at the end, too, that we've just set out the second link uh, went out today, the second survey. So we're going to be doing this every other year to collect trends. And, um, and Stephen, maybe we could give that link when you send out the slides. Would that be all right? Working yeah, that's great. Okay, Adrian yeah. Sargent's, we're, uh, we're working with the University of Plymouth, uh, the Hartswick Center for Sustainable uh, Philanthropy this time. They're conducting the survey, but that would be good. All right, so one of the questions we asked is, do you have a uh, strategic planning? Do you have a strategic plan? 68% uh, of the people that responded said, oh, yeah, yeah, of course you have a strategic plan. 29% said, nope, uh, and three. <laughs> I love the 3%. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we have a strategic plan. Um, one of the reasons, and when I shared this with Jen Chang, who's a PhD in uh, philanthropic psychology at the University of Plymouth, she said, so what, Mark? So what if they have a strategic plan or not? What does that matter? So that caused us to dig a little deeper. We asked, do you have a strategic plan in writing? <laughs> all of a sudden, it dragged down. You can see it, it went from 68% said, yeah, we have a strategic plan, to 51% saying, 
well, yeah, we have it in writing. So apparently the other 18% just had it in their head. And when you do the, the data sifting, you find out that it was a lot of executive directors and CEOs that, are, um, that were the ones that said, yeah, we have a plan, but we don't have it in writing. Um, I was sharing this with one group, and they said, oh, that explains our, our board meetings. All of us have a strategic plan in their head, but it's different strategic plans because nobody's put it on paper. So we, we all think we're going to the same goal, but we have these weird fights and weird inferences going on. Um, so that was interesting to see that, you know, the, the number of uh, people that didn't have it in writing um, made it so it was only almost half the nonprofits responding didn't have a strategic plan or didn't know if they did. Um, 62% said that they didn't have a, fund, a sustainable fundraising plan in there. Uh, our colleague, Bill Littlejohn, who's going to be joining us at the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference in just a few weeks after this recording, um, is asked me to put that in there. Uh, strate traditional strategic planning it allows you, you're supposed to have your revenue model in there. How are you going to fund what you're doing? And that is not, 62% of the leaders said, more than half of the nonprofits said, oh, no, we have goals, but we don't know how we're going to fund it. It's just kind of going to happen, I guess. Um, and then 58% said that it wasn't checked at least quarterly, which is any of you that have been in the strategic planning process know that it's often a real wonderful time of dreaming and energy and vision and wow, woohoo, we could take on the world and rainbows and unicorns flying all over the place. And then it just gathers dust on a shelf in a binder or it gathers kind of digital dust on a shared drive in some organization, you know, shared drive space. Um, so the, uh, there's no regular checking going on in, more, in the majority of nonprofits that respond to the survey. And then 70% said there's no benchmarking occurred, occurred with peer organizations when they did this. So when they're thinking about what are we going to be, what's the best thing that we can be, there was no looking to see who else is doing this too. Um, and what are some of the, who, there was no, no awareness of their environment, which is a pretty important part of strategic planning. Um, so that's why at Concord Leadership Group, we say most nonprofits are doing strategic wishing, not strategic planning. They don't put it in writing. They don't know how they're going to resource it. They haven't checked to see who else is doing it in this space. Um, there's just a lot of, we hope we can do this, but we're, we're not even going to check it regularly when we get it done. The reason this matters, uh, if, and thanks to Jen Ching's question, is ha communicating a shared vision, it turns out, is directly a attached to having a strategic plan in writing. Uh, when she said, so what, Mark? They don't have a strategic plan, big whoop. And, you, and any of you that have been in leadership for any period of time know that there's this huge war going on between uh, whether you should have a strategic plan or not. Is a strategic plan just an exercise that consultants want you to do so that they can uh, get consulting fees? Or is it something that's really important to your organization's success? Um, and I'll share with you how, through the course of this how to do a, a, a very functional strategic plan without having to bring anybody outside. There can be helpful it can be really helpful to get a third party perspective, but you can do it yourself for sure. It just takes the discipline of doing it, which is where a lot of the rub comes in. Um, so we asked the, when we looked at the, the, um, there was a question about shared vision and you can see it there. Are there systems in place to ensure that all stakeholders clearly share the vision and the brand of your, of our nonprofit? When we sliced up the data to, to have the people that said, yeah, we have a strategic plan in writing, you could see 77% of people agreed, yeah, we have a shared, you know, more than, more than three quarters of the responders uh, said, yeah, we have that. We've got, we, we, there are people across our uh, organization, volunteers, board members, community people, staff, they get, there's a shared brand, there's a shared identity, there's a, a common understanding of where we're going. But when we looked at the people that didn't have it in writing, it was less than half said, yes, we have this understanding, this common understanding we're going. So more than half of the nonprofits without strategic plans and writing are kind of not even clear to themselves what they're trying to accomplish. And you can see this. Think about organizations, probably not your own, but organizations that you may have visited where different departments are passionate about what they do, but they do it in almost isolation of the rest of the organization, as though the, their entire work could happen without coordinating at all with any other part of the organization. And, and we know that that's not realistic when we take a step back to look at it, but without this common, some common touch point, which I'm calling a strategic plan, um, there's people just forget that and they just, their universe orbits uh, around their own work. And so their own work becomes exactly what the nonprofit's doing in their mind. Um, that doesn't work well when it comes to goal setting and leading a nonprofit or helping your nonprofit thrive. 
because that becomes a, like hurting cats. It's like a bunch of little pieces moving off. The picture I just got in my mind that caused me to chuckle was a bunch of wind up toys moving around in random patterns. Um, they're not actually going anywhere at all. They're not pulling together. And what we need as, uh, as, as human beings uh, we need our nonprofit sector to have organizations that are, have teams that are pulling together, both volunteer and paid, pulling together for the common good. Um, the kind of looking at this uh, without ha not having a strategic plan forces you to look at short term things. You start looking at uh, payroll. Are we meeting payroll? Which you're going to have to look at anyway. Quadrant one is definitely, you know, it's urgent and, and important. It's important that we pay the people that we employ. And it's urgent that it gets it done. Um, so I know there are some people listening here that are just struggling payroll to payroll. And that can really create uh, myopic thinking. It can be like whack-a-mole. Every couple of weeks, boom, we got another, you know, the payroll mole pops up and I got to whack it down again. And then there's this angry board member or there's this angry donor or there's an angry community person or there's all these different issues come up. And then there's the work of your nonprofit too, which we tend to separate from the people work of donors and um, board members. Uh, if you're an executive director, uh, I, I strongly encourage you to consider 30% of your time dedicated to board work. Um, you need to set goals for your board members about what you want them to learn about running a nonprofit and, and being in governance of a nonprofit. You need to set goals about their, their fundraising, what you think they need to know about fundraising and how to, how to communicate with donors, what it takes to resource a nonprofit. Um, th there could be relational goals. You shouldn't be just seeing them at the board meetings. If you're going to be an effective executive director of your nonprofit, you need to have some sort of relationship. So there's trust. So there's um, there's there's money in the emotional bank account. Um, you know, we all have bank accounts, and if we're making deposits into the emotional bank account, then there's it helps smooth out all of our operations. When things go wrong, they'll trust you because they know that you're you're they know you. So there's a, a space, a, a cushion to trust you. Um, so that leads to the short-term planning, and that's really easy to do if you don't have a long-term vision of a strategic plan. Strategic planning is usually still three to five years. Some people like to do 10. I don't know how you do that in today's culture, but it's, it's more that aspirational, where are we going, and then how are we going to get there? And what's great about that is that that helps us. I was talking to, um, I can't even remember who it was. Maybe it was Chris Davenport. Um, it must, I think it was Chris Davenport about tightrope walking. When the most common thing, to, the most like intellectually or the most rational think, seeming thing to do, if you're going to walk on a tightrope, is to look down because you want to make sure your feet are moving down. And that's like the short-term planning. I got to just see what am I doing today and I just got to get through the day and I got to get through the next day, but I can't do, really worry about the next day until I put my foot down on today. And then I'll put my foot down on the rope, uh, tomorrow's part of the rope, tomorrow. Um, but anybody that has I've listened to that is successful at tightroping says, that's a surefire way to fall. You will fall if you're just looking down at your feet. What you need to do is look straight ahead. You need to look at your end goal, and as you're focusing on the end of the rope, on the other side, your feet fall in the right place. It's kind of like driving a car. If you're only looking right in front of the car, you keep swerving, little swerves that make you very dangerous as a driver, but if you keep looking for much further ahead, you stay in your lane, you stay evenly between the lines, and you're able to drive in a much safer way. So how do we create that long-term vision? How do, we, how do we have something that even when we're in the midst of trying to make sure our feet do fall in the right place, that we can uh, look up and be reminded of where we're going? Because fortunately, <laughs> as tough as running a nonprofit is, we're not going to plummet to our death in a canyon <laughs> if we do focus on our feet and trying to get today's to-do list done. Um, there we have this flexibility of having a mix. Um, it can easily overcomplicate this process. We can easily, if you Google strategic planning, long-term vision, goal setting, organizational development, you get millions of hits, millions of results. What we try to do is limit it to four questions. So we're going to look at these four questions. And I'm going to show you something about um, organizational goal setting that helps you incorporate these goals in all levels of your organization. And then we're going to take a look at a goal planning tool that you can use individually. Uh, whether you have a title of position or influence of position, uh, I mean a title of, of leadership, a position of leadership or not, you'll be able to use this uh, magnet goal setting program and um, be able to just kind of set your own goals and create your own leadership. Because if, as you become more um, 
as your personal leadership grows, your ability to influence others grows as well. And that's where you start getting the positions of leadership because you're experiencing your own leadership and keeping commitments with yourself and setting your own goals and moving forward in your own goals and becoming the barometer, not the, thermo- the, ther- you know, the thermostat, not the barometer. The barometer reflects the atmosphere around it. The thermostat sets the temperature. That's the kind of leader you want to be. You want to be able to walk into a room and know that there's tension going on, but be the one that diffuses it. Um, and moves forward on another goal. How do you do that? Through the three steps, strategic planning, personally or organizationally, cascading goals, and then magnet goals. So let's look at the four questions of strategic planning. You can see them on your screen. Um, This is just a simple way of trying to, you just, uh, you could take yourself on a retreat um, and just hold yourself up in a hotel room, get a bunch of post-it pads and just write this stuff down. Um, The, what are you doing and why are we doing it is the first question. This is where a lot of people would get into mission and vision and guiding values, and you should get into those here. Um, the reason I don't focus on that and we don't focus at Conquer Leadership Group is that people start nitpicking about, well, what's a vision? What's the definition of a mission? And it, it's yes, it's good to have the terms clear, but usually that doesn't help your organization move forward at all. Um, so a way to think about it is the vision is your horizon. What will the world look like when your cause isn't needed anymore? What are you working toward? And the mission is how you do it. Um, your guiding values are really incredibly important. Uh, something that I don't think was, was stressed enough in, in planning this, because as you set goals, you need to look back to your values. Where, you know, as you're straddling the fence between, it's something as simple as picking up the phone or finishing a grant proposal, you need to know what the organizational values are. Is it more important that people hear a live person on the phone rather than getting voicemail? Or do you put the weight on getting your grant proposal in by deadline? What, what is the value? What's your, the guiding value? The other reason you need to know your guiding values is because you need to empower your, your team or you need to have a, a team that's empowered to make their own decisions. You don't want to be the bottleneck, whatever level of leadership you are. Um, you want to have authority and oversight, and um, you want to be able to discipline and take responsibility for bad decisions, for sure. But you don't want to have every single tedious decision have to be approved by you. Um, life's too short for that. So as you exercise them, grow them up, and trust, building trust with you, but also knowing what the guiding values are, they can then come to you and say, "Hey, look, our value is taking care of our clients, and and I think I might have crossed the line in this." Um, my, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter is expressing, is going through this right now. She wanted to help a, a parent ask her after an acting class to help her daughter. And so she took an extra 20 minutes after the class, after the theater had closed down, helping explain where they're going in the, for the rest of the semester. Um, she crossed the line. She should have said, that's great. Why don't you talk to the adults? She knows that now. But it was for the right values. It was the right reason of caring for this kid and caring for the parent and wanting to serve. So that is a different conversation than somebody who embezzles money or does something that's like a crime. Those are not values. You know, that, that would, should be beyond the pale. You should know that right up front. So express that. What are your guiding values? Is it freedom and independence of employees? Or is it bureaucracy, which is usually a bad term, but can be a really good term because it could be steadiness. It can be stability in the organization. It can be everybody knows what their part is, what order they're pulling in the ship. Um, so get those out, clear those out, and, and really allow yourself to dream. Um, another way to do it, we were just talking about it at a training I was doing yesterday in Greenville, is what would happen if your organization weren't there anymore? What would, be, what would the world miss? Uh, and hopefully you're not going to say nothing. Uh, hopefully there is something that would be missing and lacking um, if your organization didn't exist anymore. And that could also inform your mission and vision. And then look at your, the second question is, okay, so then we get this glorious vision. We love what we're doing. Uh, we'll wordsmith that, you know, you can wordsmith that. First, just get the general gist out. Um, it's great to have a mission that can fit, you know, that people can memorize and a vision that people can memorize or can fit on the back of a business card or whatever. That's, that is very good. But you need to figure out how do we get that done? That's all fun. You know, it sounds great, but what do we actually do? And this is where you can get into goals. You can uh, think of like objectives. If it's a public health objective of reducing the consumption of fatty milk uh, in a certain period of time, like Katya Andreessen talks about in Robinhood Marketing, um, that can be an objective. And then you can set up sub goals underneath that. 
Um, you could have a goal to get your um, effectiveness rate up to a certain point or your donor retention up to 80%. Um, and then you could have sub goals underneath that about it. This is the stuff we're going to do to make sure we get to those. You're going to have an extra thank you call after the, within 90 days of the first gift. We're going to show an impact report. We're going to ask for a second gift um, f sooner than we feel comfortable doing. But because we're because we're doing it out of gratitude, we're going to experiment with doing that and making sure that they make a second gift. Because if you hear J Love talk and the, the research that uh, he and uh, others have done with Amy Eisenstein. You know that if you donor gives a second gift, your your likelihood of retaining them skyrockets into the 60 percent versus the 19 percent. Um, so you, these are where you set those goals up, and you and this is this can be really the people that love the visioning process don't necessarily love this because this is much more task centered. Um, but this is also where you want to look at your situational assessments that most nonprofits apparently aren't doing. Uh, SWOT analysis is something that is uh, pretty standard: strengths, weaknesses, organ, uh, obstacles, and threats. But there's this pestle uh, that we have started doing uh, with Rogari. It's, uh, I, I learned about it from my work with Rogari uh, in the UK. Um, pestle, you, it's a, more of an outward focus thing. So what is the, what's the environmental? It's an environmental scan. What is the environment like um, politically, economically, uh, technologically? And I don't know what each letter stands for. I'm sorry. It's still new to me. But it was really interesting to look at just what's the political climate like? What's the social climate like? What's the um, technological climate like? What's the economic climate like? Um, and then, uh, then as you start taking into assess, assess all those areas, just from your own opinions and the opinions of people in the room, then you can move to a SWOT analysis, which is usually much more of the organization. What are our organizational strengths? What are our organizational weaknesses? What are some of the obstacles that may happen? What are the threats that are, that are coming toward us? Um, obstacles, not, see, there I go negative. O is opportunities. So what are the strengths of the organization? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? Where can we really see some opportunities and what are some threats that are happening in our space? So that's what the second, you go into the second question. Third question is, <laughs> the one, again, a majority of nonprofits aren't asking is, many people would say, how do we fund this? Uh, we at Conquer Leadership Group say, how do we resource it? Because it can be fundraising and for by and large, it will be fundraising. You may have fees for some of your things, but Strategic collaborations are often overlooked. And if you've done your situational assessment of who else is doing stuff like us, you may be, or who else cares about things similar to what we care about, you can find some amazing collaborations like Hilde Gottlieb talks about when she did the diaper uh, bank, first ever diaper bank. They were looking for a place, a warehouse. And so they were looking at the cost of the warehouses. And then they said, well, what if there were a nonprofit that would donate it? And fortunately, they cultivated a board that was diverse enough that they had the thought processes weren't all the same. The, the group think wasn't allowed to happen the same way because somebody immediately said, well, what do you mean nonprofit? Why, why, why are we restricting it to nonprofits? Maybe there's a company that has a warehouse. And that's exactly what happened. They found a company that had a warehouse that was thrilled to be able to use part of their warehouse to, to house the diapers. And they bought into the mission so much that they let um, the diaper bank use their van in the off hours to deliver the diapers to. Uh, and they even, I think, volunteered, uh, employees volunteered to drive the van. Uh, and they just developed this wonderful strategic collaboration, which was real dollars and cents value, as well as emotional and communal value, but real dollars and cents value because the diaper bank didn't have it to pay rent for, the, for that. So you can find, resource it in all sorts of different ways. And I don't think we think collaboratively enough on this. And I'd rather have you as a leader think collaboratively from where you're sitting rather than having a grant funder uh, foundation saying you must have three minimum of three organizations working together because those usually become really weird projects but when you're organically coming and saying who can we collaborate with then you have a much stronger place to go to funders that en enjoy seeing that collaboration happening and then the fourth question is who do we tell about it I mean this is a question that doesn't tend to come up in the strategic planning research I've seen but if you're not doing this step this fourth step um, you're just the best kept secret in town. Nobody knows what you're doing. You're probably under resourced. You probably don't have it. Your fundraising is probably not effective. Um, your staff retention is probably minimal because you're, you're probably not retaining staff very well because it's got to be internal and external marketing as you see in those bullet points. So this is where you, you what are the assessments you're doing to figure out how you're doing well? Um, and that's, we live in a really cool time where a lot of the time, a lot of our organizations are able to create our own report cards. 
people want us to have a report card. They want to know there's return on investment, but there's not a standard yet. If you've ever tried to quantify nonprofit work, you know how complex it is. So there doesn't seem to be yet a overarching standard for many industries. I, I understand there are some in like healthcare when I work to hospitals, um, that is, there are some metrics out there already, but for a lot of us, we get to make up our own report card. So as long as we make it up and keep it consistent and, and do it with integrity, of course, um, that should be, you know, I shouldn't have to say that, but we get to, to report back on what donors are doing through us uh, in a way that is, we, we get to write the rules in a large part. Um, so take that opportunity now before it gets forced on us from some other entity. Um, the advocacy aspect of this is who are the fans? our volunteers, our board members, but it's also our community officials. We need our elected officials at the local, state, regional, and federal levels to all know what we're doing as individual organizations and as a collective nonprofit sector, because if they don't, other, other voices will rush in to fill the void. And, and I could, if you have questions about that, we could talk about Olive Cook, the Olive Cook debacle in UK where a woman died and the media uh, filled in the, created a fictional story that charities hounded her to death. Uh, and even though the family said that wasn't the truth, um, it caused the entire government to to just wipe off all the privacy laws that were on the slate and create this fundraising preference service, they call it, um, that originally was going to be that you couldn't communicate to anyone as a nonprofit until they said, yes, I want you to communicate with me. So all of your direct mail, all of your marketing is gone. And you have to go door to door asking people, can we talk to you? Is it all right if we talk to you? We never asked that of, of Apple or Walmart or your cable company, but they were forcing that on nonprofits because there's this bad narrative and people weren't doing the advocacy work apparently at the different levels. But the internal and external marketing are so important. We need to tell our staff what a good job they're doing. We need to let them know. I, I found this out as a fundraiser, uh, working in a hospital. When I started telling, I started hearing great stories from donors. Why did you start giving to our organization? Oh my goodness, let me tell you about the care that this nurse gave. And she was just such a hoot. She was great. Um, or or you know, whatever it was, I would then, I realized after a while, I've got this great story. I might as well deliver it back to them. I thought they knew it. But then I started sharing it with the staff. Hey, you know, and I asked them, hey, I asked the donors, is all right if I tell, you know, can I share that back with, with her? Because I think she'd really love to know that. Um, yeah, yeah, please. She changed our life. She's, you know, we always think about that at family reunions. So as we started reporting that back to the staff, they started getting super excited because they realized somebody cares about our work. Um, and that became not only you could just see them walk taller and, and walk with more purpose and confidence, but they also started being able to say, hey, have you talked to this other person? Or I asked, I was talking to this person and I said, can I t share your name with Mark because he's doing fundraising for us. And I think that's something that we, um, he may have a project going for. And they just become this wonderful internal advocacy for you. And then of course the external marketing, which we normally think about fundraising and, um, and, mar and communications where we're trying to get the word out. So these are all in, in the fourth step. As you can tell, we could go, on uh, for that, but I want to I want to honor the fact that there's w that we're going to look at goal setting in, a, in two other ways now. Um, the reason we want to do the strategic plan is that if you know where you're going, if you know what the other end of the the, ca the canyon looks like, you're then able to set goals that will actually move you forward and don't self sabotage you. Often we self sabotage ourselves because we try to raise for the next dollar instead of raising for the full year. Um, there, we try to raise for the next small goal instead of looking at the big picture. And, and so a donor that may have given us $50,000 or $100,000 is only, only quote unquote, only giving us 10 because that's all we're asking for. Um, so, but it's all, it sabotages itself because it becomes really awkward to go back to that person 10 times for $10,000 a year when it would have been maybe natural to say, would you consider giving $100,000 this year to support the work? So having that long-term focus allows us to make better decisions. Um, it also allows us to assess our skills personally and as an organization. Huh, to be that kind of organization, to run, to make that kind of impact, what skills do I need to have? What skills do our team need? Our, what skills do our team need to develop? Is it better people skills? Is it learning more about who are their personality traits like through DISC or Highlands or Myers-Briggs? Is it learning communication skills so that they can talk to each other in a more productive way? Uh, what is it? Is it technical expertise in a certain area? Is it going back to 
to uh, col to a, a college for research in statistics because we're not doing that as accurately as we could be. Whatever it is, you now know because you know where you're going. Um, and then it also helps with the fundraising, as I said about not only getting, uh, being able to make the more accurate solicitations, but think about all the costs that are involved. All it, Donors are not just investing in the sandwich that you're handing to someone or the acre of land that you're preserving or the cat that you're spaying or neutering. I don't know which, which cats get, but um, they're also investing in you're being able to be smart about doing that and you're being able to know where the you know where your community is going and what's keeping up on your on the current research and you're being able to employ people to be able to carry that out it's the overall mission so you want to have all costs that you're accounting for not just individual project costs in your fundraising uh, and you can do that with your with your you know with your found having a strategic plan and you can set goals for that by going running through a gift range calculator like giftrangecalculator.com um you can look at that gives you the different uh, prospect levels to ask people at and then you can just set up the number of prospects if you're going to raise $100,000 you need to have um 3 to 5 people that are able to give a quarter of that uh, in the range of 10% to 25% of that so you can start setting your goals that way. Um, one last thing on fundraising goals for running a nonprofit is I'd really encourage you to think about running three to five year averages. Not, um, I'm seeing a lot of boards that are saying, wow, we doubled our fundraising last year. We're going to double it again this year. And that's not realistic or right. Um, unless you're going from like $10 to $20. Yeah, yes, you can raise $40 the next year. That's probably realistic. But um, a saner way to do this is to look at a three or five year rolling average. Uh, and if you're a fundraiser that's being foisted, having these you know pie in the sky kind of fundraising goals just shoved on you, uh, one way to re report back to them may be, well, over the last five years, our fundraising has grown this much. Um, so I think that it's reasonable to stretch goal would be to raise it based on that historical data to raise it this much more, but not the 100% that's being reported. Um, you can start educating people well on that. But hopefully you can see you can see the other side clearly as you're looking forward and you can make better steps as you go. Um, once you have those goals, this is where I get, this is the fun part of the, the presentation for me. As you can tell, I'm pretty enthusiastic about this whole thing. But what, so I've had fun up until now, but this is something that I learned from a client in Northern New England, um, a concept that uh, has just transformed the organizations that I've been able to work with because the typical run, way of running a nonprofit, think of the typical executive director. I call them CEOs because board members don't know what an executive director is, but they do understand viscerally what a CEO is. And I want board members and volunteers to, to esteem the leader of the nonprofit as much as they, they deserve to be esteemed. So I say CEO, um, even though most of our titles for our organizations are executive directors. But the typical CEO of a nonprofit gets this list foisted on them from the board. It's random. It's, uh, as in our survey, we found that over half the CEOs aren't getting annual performance reviews. Um, so it's not based on any, usually the, the data isn't based on anything other than here's our budget line items. We need to make X percent more, uh, you know, let's raise 10% more. Let's, uh, have employee enjoyment go or satisfaction go up 12%. And it just seems like this kind of mishmash casserole of a to-do list that gets shoved on them. It was cooked up in some board meeting. Now, the CEO, being a good leader, wants to own that. She owns that as her personal, this is my list to, to do. This is my boss's objectives for me for the year. And then she turns to her staff and asks them, hey, what do you need you know, as a, to run your, the finance department and to do the program stuff and to do the fundraising? What are the things you need to be able to excel at your job? Because she's a good facilitative, collaborative leader. So she's asking that. But what happens is, she gets crushed between the board's expectations and this leader's expectations. So when she's working on her board's goals, her leaders are saying, huh, what are you doing? Why aren't you helping me? You know, whether it's staff, you, you, even if you don't have senior leaders, even if it's, you have staff reporting to you, when you're working on your board goals, you feel like your, your staff is wondering where you are. And when you're working on your staff goals, you know the whole time you're not fully present with them because in the back of your mind, you're thinking, this isn't on my report card. My helping this person keep, do this stuff isn't something the board's going to ask me about if I get an annual review in next year. Um, and it just grinds you, crushes you down. 
the cascading goals is different. First of all, it starts with, you can see a strategic plan. You have one, you have a common agreed upon, publicly hashed out, publicly, at least in the, in the sense of a group, there's, there's, it's written down. It's not everybody singing from their own song sheet. And that influences the conversation with the CEO and the board to create the list of the goals for the year. But it's not the CEO's to-do list. It's the organization's goals for the year. In order to get to our strategic plan, in order to do what we're trying to accomplish, these are the things that will take in the next 12 months that we can do that will help us get further to our strategic, the, the objectives in our strategic plan. And then the CEO is empowered to go to her staff and not say, what do you need? But, hey, here's the board's objectives for the organization. Where do you see yourself fitting in that, in each of these? And I, I think that's a really important question because you might assume that the CFO sees themselves or the director of finance sees themselves as fitting in the finance goals, but they may also see themselves sitting in another goal. And, and you want to find that out because as you can have more cross-training within the organization, you make it stronger. Not that you're usurping authority or anything like that, but when the CFO is helping the fundraiser or helping the program's people uh, and not staying in a silo, you get a much better overall organization. So the first question you say is, here's it. You don't frame it as my goals. These are the, or, the board's goals for our organization for the next 12 months. Where do you see yourself fitting into those? And in, then you ask, in order to do your job well, what do you need from us? You know, not that I can promise to do this, but what, would it be, what do you need? Uh, how can we make it so that you can, you can excel in your position? Can you see that if you do that, now that cascading effect of the board and CEO conversation becoming organizational goals, and it just kind of spills down through the organization, all your daily work starts wor working naturally with your strategy. It all is informed by your, by your, your, your overall goals. Is it going to be perfect? Of course not. We're human beings. We mess up. We get, we get our you know, twisted attitudes and we stub our toes and other people and we get you know, our opinion, our egos get hurt and bruised, but there's this other, there's this, um, integrity that comes in the organization because it's integrated so that's cascading goals only really works well with a strategic plan but i would say to you guys that are listening to this and gals that if you were to take your list as an executive director or as a senior leader right now and turn to your the, your direct reports and say these are the organizational or departmental goals for the year how do you see yourself playing in those and what do you need to get them done you might have an amazing start at working a mini cascade within your organization, even if you don't have the strategic plan and the collaboration with your board yet. Um, that language can really help you and free you. Now, let's look at magnet goals. What, let's say you have a, a, how do you figure out what goals are the important ones to work on? I'm gonna do this from an individual level uh, because we all, as I alluded to before, need to start with individual, we need to start with our individual leadership. The only place to build trust is Stephen M. R. Covey, Stephen Covey's son says, and the speed of trust is uh, the best place to build it, if, if, even if you don't have a position of leadership, is by keeping, a, keeping commitments to yourself. If you say you're going to do something, just start with like saying you're going to you know, get to work at a certain time each day or make a commitment to the exercise or make small commitments. And the more that you continue to fulfill promises to yourself, the more you grow in your ability to trust yourself and your commitments. And that has this ripple effect on the way you do your work. But same with goal setting. So um, I've been doing this for about 15 years now. Um, and the first time I did this was um, just life goals, not just. <laughs> it was life goals, though. Um, the, you list out 100 goals and dreams that you want to do, accomplish. Now, I try to push myself to do that each year. Um, and I don't always hit those numbers. And trust me, this isn't for everybody, but I encourage everybody to try it at least once. Some people only just don't, the idea of, Pro building process is just too challenging. But what you'll find, even if you try it one time, you'll find that the first 10, pretty qu quick. There's dollar goals, family goals, work goals, whatever that come up, travel goals. Then the next 10 are like pulling teeth. They're so hard. But then you get into another a flow of, of goals and dreams and visions. And, and be goofy with these. I, I had Oprah being positively interviewed. I, I firmly believe in writing down goals, and I firmly believe and writing down the right goals. So I didn't want to just be interviewed by Oprah. I want to be positively interviewed by Oprah. So I had that on my list long after she took her show off the air. And you know what? It popped up again on my list this year because she's still doing powerful interviews that have impact. So 
Um, and, you know, is that ever going to happen? I have no idea, but that's not the place. This isn't the place for, for rational. This could definitely happen. It's, it's high, pie in the sky stuff. Um, if you need help with this, and there's, uh, there'll be a link at the end on how you can get a free copy of this. Um, but you can list things to do. You can list health goals. You can list money goals. You can list relationship goals. You can list travel goals, lifelong learning goals. Um, you just list them out. Try to get it. It takes a few days to do this. And once you've done that, put it in the drawer and let it rest for a few days. Now, if you only were to stop there and not look at it for 12 months, uh, you'd be amazed at how many of the goals you would have accomplished. There's, a, I don't know if it's a Maxwell Maltz in Psycho-Cybernetics. Um, I think it is. It talks about how our brains are goal-seeking machines. And when we give them a focus, they will work to help that focus come into being. Uh, that's why you'll never hear me, uh, you'll hear me be very careful about my words. I will not say, uh, I tend not to say negative things because I don't want, like I, I will not say, oh, I, f I keep forgetting that. What you'll hear me say is, oh man, I'm not remembering that. Because I want the remembering to be what my brain is trained to think of. I'm a guy that remembers as intend, instead of a guy that forgets. Because according to the, the Maxwell Maltz's writing uh, and a lot of the other research or the other writing, I'm not sure how researched it was, but a lot of the other writing uh, in the 20th century, that the goal you give your, your brain, they will make sure, your brain will be a good clerk and try to find the, you know, you know, make that true. If you keep saying you're forgetful, you'll find that you forget a lot of things. But if you keep saying, wow, good things tend to happen to me. Look at that. People just, I love that. People like to do nice things to me. You'll be amazed at how often you see that. Um, sure, it's confirmation bias for those of you that know that term and influence, but it's true. All, I mean, it, it becomes your story that you're telling yourself. Anyway, if you were to just let that go and let, put it in your drawer, you'd, you'd accomplish far more than you'd have expected. Uh, and you wouldn't even know you're accomplishing them. But we're not done. What you want to do next is take out a sheet of paper and write what I call a history of the future. You review the goals, review your list of 100 or how many ever you were able to get down, and you project yourself 12 months into the future and say, what would life be like? How would I feel? What would people be saying about me? What would, what would be a, happening? What would the impact be because these things were accomplished? If, you know, so you assume that everything was accomplished on the list. Um, and just do create a creative writing exercise. Tell the story. What, 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 is, it, what is it like? Um, and that is incredible. I find that to be incredibly encouraging anyway, even though it seems hokey and kind of once you get past the hokiness, you're just like into that. It's, it's fun. Um, and then you let it, that rest for a few days also. Because you just want to, just, this isn't a process you rush. Now this, the key, the, the special kind of secret sauce of the magnet goals process is the next step. You can't do it until you've done the 100 and the history of the future. But the next step is rereading the goals and looking for the, the magnet goals. These are the ones that pop out at you. And it's, I know this is going to sound spooky or whatever, possibly, but um, some of them are going to make sense. Some of them, you know, if I accomplish this goal, six more on my list are accomplished as well. I have to do those six to get the t this goal done. So this has become a central goal for me. This becomes one of my magnet goals. Rationally, it makes sense. But you'll be shocked. There are others that will just pop off the, off the sheet at you. And just have the, you know, do, just circle them when they do. Uh, when I first did this in 2003, one of them was uh, ballroom dancing lessons with my wife. It had nothing to do with my personal, professional life at all. And it seemed bizarre that it was there. But ballroom dancing lessons with my life, wife, um, got circled and became one of my magnet goals. These goals are then your 20%. You know, the whole Pareto principle, 20% of, uh, of the work results in 80% of the, of the impact. These are the 20% that you want to make sure that you're working on because other things will come on. You'll have to do the other stuff anyway. But these are the ones that will really help you move the ball down the field in your life. Um, and you can read in the, in the magnet goals workbook how that whole goal and ended up sharing in a very tr transitional time in my family and in our life and our work uh, it showed my wife that she was still more important than my work because I was trying to figure out, all right, bottom dancing lessons. I'm not sure that we can afford a babysitter and a class uh, where we were at that point. So what if we had a dance teacher come to us? How would that look? And who are dance teachers that do that? And would it be a student that did that? Uh, so there's a lot of fun ways that you can start thinking creatively when you know what your magnet goals are. Um, and then you create a roadmap with those. You write your magnet goal at the top um, and you write out 
what has to happen in order for that goal to be accomplished. You think, when does it have to be accomplished? You know, having that deadline makes it a goal. Otherwise, it's just a wish. Um, so when does it have to be accomplished by? Uh, who are your allies and resources that are going to help you get that done? Um, and then the counterintuitive one that Zig Ziglar uh, introduced me to, and I didn't like this because I'm a positive thinking guy. I don't like thinking about obstacles. I think that's, you know, I don't like focusing on the negative. But when in his goal setting work, he said to think about obstacles. And that made a lot of sense after a while because they're going to happen. This is life after all. Um, and so if you are planning for your obstacles, then you're also able to know who can help you get over those obstacles. Um, so writing down what are some of the things that might get in the way of me accomplishing this goal or our organization accomplishing the goal. Um, you can then, and then you can write who you can turn to in that moment um, if, that, if that roadblock actually does come up. And then the, uh, the study, after, study after study shows that if you have a coach or an accountability person, um, someone that's gonna ask, that has permission to ask you, how are you doing on this goal, that's when you're going to get your goals uh, really accomplished. Because even if you're, for me with my coach, even if it's 20 minutes before my call with my coach and I'm emailing the people that I said I was going to email when she asked me two weeks ago, at least I'm emailing them and getting the things in motion, <laughs> um, which, you know, having that deadline and that accountability can really force you to do that. So big thing is, uh, as we're wrapping up, if, I hope there's some questions and answers to get some time here. I hope there are answers. That would be on me, but I hope there are questions too. Um, I'd encourage you as you're listening to this, don't go do this whole thing alone. Uh, we live in an amazing time of connectivity where we can find people like us either in our community or around the world. Um, and so if you're not in a, a, if you're in a sort of toxic situation and you can't really talk to people in your community or your organization about the goals you want to set, um, find it somewhere else. Join AFP, join AHP, join um, some YNPN, join some group and start volunteering for the board of trustees or, or directors so that you can um, have some peer level group that is able to tell you, just give you some good honest feedback from outside yourself. Um, because oftentimes we color the water and we, we aren't really the best um, interpreters of the events that happen to us. Um, and that will help you be able to make sure that the, <laughs> the bridge you're building as you're walking across it ends up where you hope it will go, <laughs> not in some place totally other. other. Um, great. There's the link for the, the Magnicals if you want to get a free copy of that. Um, and... Stephen, how are we doing with questions? I see this. The chat again is really tiny in my in my yeah. window, but it looks like there's a lot of words there. I don't know. We have some questions. questions if you want. Okay, cool. Yeah, you want to dive into them? <laughs> Absolutely. There's some good ones here. Um, I'll just start at the top. Um, here's one from Cam. Cam is asking, what do you recommend when a development committee requests that the goals <laughs> be raised well beyond? what they've done. So more than double, 150% perhaps, uh, only because that committee thinks that that's where the organization should be, you know, regardless of whether it's attainable or historically possible or whatever. What do you think? Oh, Cam, my heart goes out to you because that, that is Sorry, a Cam. sucky situation to be in um, because <laughs> you get competitive people in a room. And the only way you make, I mean, there's a, there's a reality to the fact of, Setting those big, hairy, audacious goals gets you much further along. Um, Scott Harrison, Charity Water, had the the guts, the intestinal fortitude to stand up in front of 3,000 of us uh, fundraisers at an AFP conference in Vancouver and say, I can't hang out with people like you. Because you guys get excited mm -hmm. over a 1% raise in donations over the year. Um, I have to mm -hmm. hang out around tech giants that are saying, why aren't you, you know, my IPO just tripled, the 300% growth, why aren't you? Um, and so there is right. a reality of we need to be putting ourselves into those conversations, but um, it, where it, if you can, uh, if I were talking to that development committee, uh, I would first say if you're setting that goal as a development committee, you're saying you and your board members are going to write the check to fulfill that. You're taking responsibility for that. Um, and what are you going to do that's 150% more work than you've done? We have a staff. Mm -hmm. We're going to do our, our goal. We're going to work hard for this because we believe we love your passion. But you, if we're going to do, triple our, uh, our, out, our, our effort, what are you doing to triple your effort? How many more people are you calling to thank for the gifts that are being made? And how many more people are you asking to make double gifts? 
are you each willing to give 150% more than you gave last year? Um, mm. Putting it back on the personal responsibility of, and it doesn't have to, and it, it's really hard. You have to practice this in advance because you don't want it to be emotionally, you know, well, what, what, where are you going to you know, show me the money? You know, you don't want it to be that kind of thing, but you want it to be yep. a great, that's awesome. Love the passion um, to do 150% more. It'll take each one of us giving 150% more and challenging others to give 150% more and talking to 150% more of the people than we did last year. So yep. how are you doing with your assignment list? Have you done you, what? You didn't talk to anybody last year? Yeah. Well, maybe. You oh, you don't give. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're not a you're not contributing to our organization. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so. board giving. I mean, as you know, is abysmal. So it, it seems like there's this huge disconnect between aggressive leadership, including the board, setting these big goals. But then, you know, less than half, I think, according to the surveys I've seen, of boards oh, wow. actually give. So it's just. <laughs> and part of that's our fault. Part of it is we say it is. we lie to board members. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. It won't be a lot of work, and it's neither. Yep. It's usually a lot of work, and we it's never not usually fun. But yeah, and there's no – you're not expected to give. There's no expectation. And, I, yeah, so that's – part of it is on us. I mean, we never – it's – I always am a believer that if, if they're not doing the behavior that we want them to do, we haven't communicated well enough. And part of the reason I believe that is because – I want that to be, um, I don't want to ever be a victim. I don't want to ever be powerless and I'm empowered to change the way I speak. If they're not, if they're not having the outcomes that I expect them to have, then I'm clearly not speaking their dialect yet. So yep. hopefully, gosh, but my heart goes out to you because it can get to this group think of rah, rah, slap on the back. Yeah. We're going to be part of that. We're going to, you know, we're going to be the ones that are going to, we're going to just, our, we're going to ride the coattails of this organization that, um, uh, did amazing work. Well, no, you're actually going to have right. to roll up your sleeves and help. Here's a, a similar question, and I'm going to I'm going to have the uh, the questioner remain anonymous uh, for uh, privacy reasons because it's kind of a tough question. Um, but uh, this is coming from a direct uh, development director uh, who feels okay. like their CEO just kind of treats them like an ATM. So they've got their own goals, but oh, the CEO. Yeah doesn't really take ownership of those goals. Any advice for this uh, struggling development director? Oh, struggling development director. Um, I'm sorry that I'm going to say this first, but I would start dusting off my resume. Um, Ooh, yeah. Your life is too short to be treated that crappily. Um, mm -hmm. And if there are any executive directors listening, you cannot subcontract your fundraising. Your right. responsibility as the top leader at the nonprofit is the resource development of your nonprofit as well as the programs because you do not have programs if you do not have resources. And you need to get right. your butt in gear and talk to donors and thank donors for gifts and make the uncomfortable hard ass and understand that there's no instant return, that it's organic, it's not mechanical. You're not invoicing people like you're paying bills. You're developing human relationships with people that are going to let you down and people that are going to surprise you with generosity. You've got to get into the fight. Um, but if you're the development director, a little passionate, passion tapped in there. I didn't realize that was there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the development director that's in that spot, part of it could be setting goals for what you, like if you were the executive director having to set goals for board members, maybe it's setting goals for what do you want the, develop, the executive director to know about fundraising. And they're not going to listen to you, uh, unfortunately, because that's part of, it seems like what nonprofits are. We hire the best and then we stop listening to them. Uh, boards do this to CEOs, yeah. CEOs do this to staff. Um, so it's looking at the fundraising effectiveness data from, that Bloomerang is so good at putting out there. Um, yeah. It's looking at the, the critical thinking from Regare. They have some special event stuff that's going on. It's a little bit headier and academic. There's still, we're still not, you know, we don't have the popular distillation of this stuff yet. Um, but it's becoming the best expert in fundraising that you can. Um, is it all right if I plug something of mine? Oh, please plug away. You've, you've given us an hour of okay. your genius. Yeah, so, <laughs> so here's a whole bunch of resources. Join the Nonprofit Academy. It's only $19 a month, and you get access to over 80 trainings of the best people in the, in the space teaching you how to do stuff 24-7, plus live coaching calls and new, new trainings every month. Go to the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference. Um, Watch Movie Mondays. We always have great people coming in there. There's going to be somebody, or Chris does, because he, he runs that. Um, there's a ton of different tools out there. Join the AFP chapter if yours is an effective one. 
uh, maybe the American, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways to learn how to tell the dialect of the CEO that that's not realistic. Um, and, and I speak yep. from a part of the passion comes from having lived, sat in that seat. Uh, I was no longer invited to the hospital's uh, board meetings. My position wasn't, it was before I was there. They said the board meetings are getting too, too uh, full, which is just ludicrous because then you have to learn the, and I'm sorry, but it's, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to say it. You have to learn the bullshitting skills of when your board member comes into your office and says, I'm so glad you're going to raise an extra hundred thousand dollars in addition to your, your annual fund. Um, and you have to, you're going nuts screaming, like, what are you talking about? And you're right. having to, you know, calmly say things like, so, well, tell me, uh, what was what was the most exciting about the project? You know, what are the points that you like the most? Because <laughs> you're trying to figure out what the heck he's talking about. Um, real life example did happen to me. Um, and so it's also training your board when you do report back to them about uh, it's not just dollars in the door. It's how many visits are being made, how many thank you calls are being made. I know, solicitation, it, stewardship, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship are, you know, you have to sow the seeds as well as reap the harvest as well as tend the soil so you can sow the seeds again. And it's a long game. Um, and it's, it's definitely doable within an organization. Uh, but the way it was expressed by Stephen, it sounds like it may also be good to start looking because there's a dearth of really good fundraisers yeah. out there. Uh, and most organizations uh, that are, have a job opening are in the second or third round of looking because they're just not finding the candidates they want. Yeah. And I, I can attest that oh. that questioner I know is a high-quality person. So <laughs> okay. hopefully it won't come to that. Well, on that note, um, this was awesome, Mark. Well, we've and done it. I would just, what an hour. I, I feel like a good one. Guys. You've done it. You've wasted a perfectly good hour listening to No, <laughs> not a waste. <laughs> well, I would well, just uh, echo Mark's sentiments of checking out all these great resources, especially that nonprofit academy. I mean, that's a bargain at that price, and I've seen those resources, really good stuff. And if you want to go to the nonprofit storytelling conference, in San Diego next month, uh, Boomerang is giving away uh, some coupons to offset that cost. So check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, send me a message. Reply to the survey. You're going to get at the end if you're interested in that because uh, we'd love to see you there. Uh, it's a great we, event we for sure. People double and triple their fundraising coming out of that. Um, you know, yes. it's, it's probably like the diet commercial is not not. It, you know, results will vary, but um, it's pretty remarkable what what's going on there. It's taken us by surprise, yep. and we love we love being part of it. It's really cool. That might be the best conference in the sector. I, I know this is being recorded, but uh, I don't think I'll regret saying that for sure. So <laughs> check it out. <laughs> I'm getting a recording, right? So I can play that too? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, no. It's awesome. down there forever. That's okay. Yeah. I'll own it. No, thanks for being um, a This is awesome, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. What do we have? Is there another slide about what's coming up next? Uh, yeah, actually, we have we got BloomCon, which is the second best conference after the I would say at least conference. second and third because it's maybe two. Yeah, doesn't compete. Phoenix in February. Uh, special pricing going on now. If you're interested in that, great speakers, great lineup, a lot of fun. Um, we got some great webinars coming up, including today. That is not a typo. We have another webinar today in one hour uh, with Claire oh. Axelrad. This one with Mark is part one of a, a double header. So got the rest of the afternoon free, and if you're not already registered for that, check it out. We're going to be talking about uh, year-end fundraising appeals. It's not too late. I know it's mid-October when we're uh, doing this, but uh, not too late if you haven't gotten those out the door. So check that out. It's going to be fun. One hour from now, 56 minutes from now, I guess. Uh, but next week, back at our regular time slot, 1 p.m., uh, branding. We've got Sarah Durham from Big Duck, which is one of my favorite branding firms in the nonprofit sector. i um, going to talk about how to kind of bridge that gap between uh, the brand, the logo, the mission statement, all those good things that make up a brand, and the programs, the services offered by the nonprofit. Those want to, you gotta want to uh, align those. And uh, if you're not aligned, check out that webinar. Or maybe you're not sure if you're aligned. Uh, Sarah will tell you. That's gonna be a really good one. She's an awesome speaker. Um, and we got some other ones scheduled out into November already. So check out our webinar page. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in an hour, if not next week. Um, but we'll call it a day for now at least. Uh, look for an email from me with the recording and the slides. Uh, check out all Mark's goodies and uh, tell us what you thought. There's going to be a short survey there. You won't hurt my feelings. I don't think you'll hurt Mark's either. Um, no. <laughs> but we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. So, Mark, I'll see you in a couple weeks, my friend. All right. See you in a couple weeks in San Diego. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon. All right. Talk to you all soon.